With us now is Ellen Latham. Ellen is president and co-founder of Centauri Corporation, the people who make the Alpha Centauri computer music system. Gary? Ellen, uh, what you have here seems to be somewhat different from uh, Will's uh, previous uh, demonstration. Uh, how, does, how does what you're doing differ from the music instruction set? Well, we're both in the music business, and we're both, in fact, using computers to do things that are musical. The key concept behind Centauri and what we do with music, simply music, is turn it into a musical instrument, a live musical instrument that you can play, you can listen to, you can transform sounds with, you can design sound, you can compose, and you can even learn keyboard. So what I actually can show you today is a program we call Simply Music. What I'm looking at on the screen here is a list of albums. Just as I have a 45 RPM record on my player or 33, so I have a diskette. It goes into my disk drive. And now when I do a directory or catalog, I can see the list of songs I have previously recorded or someone else recorded loaded in. Why don't we listen to Yezu? Now, I played that piece in a couple of weeks ago, or someone else did, or perhaps you played it in yesterday. If you're learning to play keyboard, though, listening to music is not just what you need to do. You also need to see what's going on. So we're using the power of the computer now to give you a keyboard instrument that you can play and listen to, give you a video screen that shows you the music you're playing, and... If you uh, don't know how to read music, I will help you even further. I can load in a display of the keyboard itself so that when I play back Yezu, I can see the parts that were played. Now, that's a fairly complex piece. If I were learning to play music, if I'd never approached a musical instrument before or a computer music system, I might choose a more easy-to-learn song. For instance, Merrily. Now, this is a pretty simple song, but it gets the point across that you too can learn to play keyboard with this fairly fancy technology just by That sounds like segue music, Ellen, and I'm going to take advantage of that music to turn to John for a second. And, uh, John, one thing, uh, of course, you're dealing with a, a computer so large we couldn't bring it here in the studio at, at your Stanford location. One thing you're involved in is music notation. I think you have an example of that in front of you. Show yeah. us what that is. Well, it's an extension of the same idea, and I guess uh, demonstrates what one can do uh, with an enormous amount of effort and over a large number of years. This is a program that was developed by Leland Smith, also on the music faculty, uh, who over a 10-year period has, uh, has refined the music manuscripting uh, program which allows one to use a, a standard printer plotter to output uh, music in large scale and then it's photo reduced for to become publishable qu quality. Well, the advantages are that uh, the, his program automatically finds or uh, does part extraction, finds page turns, and and of course uh, eliminates all the problems of error making in, in music publishing. So it's a it's a contribution of, of considerable uh, importance, I think, in the music industry. The same basic ideas, but reaching a very high degree of refinement. John, okay, you've brought with with you an audio tape from your system at Stanford. We're going to play that tape right now, and if you can put on the headset so that you can hear it as we play. And, and tell us what's going on in this audio tape. Okay, this is an example of high quality uh, vocal synthesis using frequency modulation synthesis. Uh, it took, a, took me about uh, oh, six months to find the, the little cues to naturalness that seem to be so very often lacking in, in most electronic uh, music synthesis. Now, having worked out this algorithm, we can play the next example and hear an extension of nature into a slightly unreal domain. For example, I've modeled now the human voice, but of a very, very large man. So it's deeper than any real human being could sing, as if uh, he had a six-foot chest, chest, I guess, and a three-foot neck. So the vocal resonances are greatly amplified because we have this independent control over the dimensions of sound in its abstract form. Now, one of the most important things about synthesis, and uh, which will accrue to devices as, as uh, such as this and the things that little synthesis algorithm that Will was using, uh, has to do with using the technology in such a way that we, we, ha we have uh, a very clear sense of what's natural sounding. The next example demonstrates 
first just a pure tone, which we'll, we'll hear, which is the pitch of what will become a sung vocal tone. Then in a few seconds we add all the harmonics or information that would be present in a real sung tone, but it only becomes natural at the moment we introduce the vibrato and this, this kind of wiggling in the pitch space, which uh, is common to all natural sounds virtually. Once more, pure tone, now harmonics, but not natural. And now it sounds natural, it sounds vocal-like. So we can, by doing a, a vast amount of research and analysis in psychoacoustics and signal processing, we can extend to this miniaturization, which we see, a kind of quality of sound, which I think will be a very great improvement. Okay, John, uh, we're going to move from Stanford now and go back uh, across the country to uh, Cambridge and MIT's Experimental Music Studio for a brief performance of a duet for piano and computer. <laughs> 